Okay, thanks everyone for joining. I'm excited you came out today to hear about Xamarin Forms in Visual Studio 2017. I'll be your presenter. Uh, my name is David Ortnow. I'm a senior program manager with the Mobile Developer Tools Group uh, at Microsoft and Xamarin. And uh, just a quick background on me, I've been doing web, touch, and mobile for a little over 20 years, uh, running my own companies as well as working in the enterprise and uh, mostly in the creative and advertising realm. Um, so I've been using Xamarin for quite a few years, back when it was called MonoTouch and MonoDroid, and have also written many apps in Objective-C and Swift and even done some Java on the Android side as well. So let's uh, dive into what we're going to be covering today. I'm very excited about this. So we'll start with an overview of Xamarin, Xamarin Forms, and XAML, and kind of just set the expectations about what this ecosystem is and what we're talking about. And then we're going to quickly dive into some demos. Um, we'll talk about customizing our UI, how we can progressively enhance from uh, the Xamarin Forms common UI expression all the way down to the native platform and get complete control over what we're doing. Then we'll dive into enhancing performance, whether that's layouts, list views, um, how we can make our apps as quick as possible so that we get that nice responsive UI. And then we'll have some resources and QA at the end. Anytime throughout the presentation, please add your questions in the chat and uh, we'll answer them as we go and make sure that we get to everything. Cool? All right, let's dive in. So Xamarin Forms, XAML, what are we talking about? The promise of Xamarin is this. Native user interface, native experience, native performance, high fidelity API access. And what we mean by that is anything that the device can do, we're going to give you access to it. And this is done by creating native bindings to the underlying SDKs on iOS, Android, and then of course on Windows, UWP, etc. So as it says here, anything you can do in those languages, you can do with C Sharp and Visual Studio. So this is what the approach looks like, and this is really what drew me to the Xamarin stack, is the ability to share all that C Sharp logic, all your business logic, your service calls, your you know, processing, all that stuff is, can be done there. And then you create your, your platform-specific UI for those platforms, iOS, Android, Windows, etc. You still get that high performance, you still get the native API access, everything is there, but you start to share so much of what you're doing. So the, the, the best of breed way to go about this, and this is really what everything that Xamarin has is built upon, is the Xamarin native approach. So this is Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android, and then on Windows you have UWP. And uh, again, you're sharing all that C-sharp logic, but on iOS what you're going to do is you're going to build your UI in code, uh, but you're going to be using the uh, Objective-C or Swift APIs, and you can use storyboards, you can use nib files, and you're doing it just as if you were building that UI in Xcode. Uh, Android, very similar, XML or AXML, you can describe all your layouts there. Of course, you're using drawables for all of your images. And then you do similar things on Windows, UWP, XAML, that sort of thing. But you're building those interfaces three times. Um, so the, the benefit there is that you get full control over those experiences and you're getting that full native performance. Um, and then you can still share all of your logic. So if, you, if performance is a premium feature for you across all the platforms, then this is where you want to be. You're going to get the most control here in Xamarin Native. Now, if you're looking to share more of your UI, this is where Xamarin Forms comes in. This provides you a, a cross-platform UI abstraction toolkit so that you can express that UI once and have it rendered for each platform uniquely. Um, you still have the ability, because it's built on top of Xamarin Native, Xamarin iOS and Android are all still there, UWP is still there, and you can get down into it, and we're going to cover that in some of these demos. Um, but you get a massive amount of code share, whereas on Xamarin Native, in my experience, I was able to get 60 to even 80% code share across all of my platforms, and I was targeting multiple platforms. Um, with Xamarin Forms, you're going to get into the 90s, high 90s. And some of that depends on how you architect your applications, but uh, it's, it can be fantastic and amazing and it's certainly more wonderful to maintain that code base when it's all shared. So how does Xamarin Forms achieve this? So I've chosen three of our uh, common renderers 
and uh, looked at how we express those on each platform. So when you ask for a content page, which is kind of your, your base page class, on Android, you're going to get either a fragment or a view. That's a native Android fragment, native Android view. And uh, that's going to depend on what the containing parent application is. That's an Android thing. On iOS, you're going to get the UI view controller. On UWP, you're going to get a page. But the thing I want to, to really show off here is that when you are asking for a content page, a label, a picker, what you're getting on each platform is a native UI control. Um, it's not being faked out. Uh, you're getting the real deal. So it's going to perform natively. Um, on the picker side, I, I wanted to show this because you can see that it's really a composite of many different uh, UI elements. And what's great about that is if you are going to implement a picker experience in an iOS application or an Android application, you're going to end up making it, these controls, if not more, to get the actual experience on your form for that. And so what we have in forums is we've already bundled that all up together. The experience is ready to go. And of course, you can get in there and tweak it. We'll show that in some demos here. Um, but that work is done for you. So that's a nice productivity boost. So when we talk about renderers, this is what we're talking about. Uh, in forms, you get the abstract API for that render, what the content page and the label exposes to you for each platform um, commonly. And then underneath, within each platform, is the platform-specific renderer. And you'll hear those phrases a lot, platform-specific and renderer. Um, those come up frequently. So it's good to understand what's really going on there and why we keep saying that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about XAML because XAML is extremely popular. It's a very popular way to express your UI. But uh, I think there's some misconceptions, perhaps, about what it is. So uh, what it is is extensible application markup language. It is a markup language specification, right? So uh, by itself, it really doesn't do anything. What it does is exposes the underlying object model of the platform that it's being used with. So if you're using UWP, you're getting UWP APIs. If you're using Xamarin Forms, you're getting Xamarin Forms APIs. Um, so what you see on the left here is a content page expressed in XAML with a label inside of it. And that's all it is. On the right is the C-sharp representation of exactly the same thing. So what I want to demonstrate here is this is the same thing. Um, when it gets compiled, when it gets run, it's the same thing. Um, so whether you use XAML or whether you express your UI in C-sharp, you are getting the same thing. It's really up to you what your preference is. Now XAML compiled. So you'll hear the phrase XAML C. Um, what we're saying is, is that this is compile time. So uh, when you enable XAML C, either at your application level, as you see in this example here, it's outside of my namespace, so I am compiling my entire application, or you can opt in or out by page um, using similar expression. This is going to compile uh, your XAML every time you build. And the benefits here are that you get that validation right away. You don't have to run your application to see if your XAML is compliant or not or, or what's going on. Um, you can get that at compile time. And then we've heard from our customers that have run some tests against this that they're seeing four times faster performance at runtime or even better. Uh, depending on how complex your page is, how big your layouts are, when you enable XAML C, it's running much faster. Um, and if you enable AOT, ahead of time compilation on Android, which is something I, I certainly encourage you to, to go look into, we're not covering that here today, but just a note for you, you're going to see even greater performance. Now there are some uh, side effects to your applications. It may grow slightly in size because now you have some IL bundled with your assembly, that's intermediate language, when you compile ahead of time. Um, but uh, the performance in your case may be well worth that. So certainly something to look into. I encourage that. Uh, as I mentioned, if you have any questions, I know I just kind of covered a lot of stuff right there. Uh, ask them in the chat, and we'll certainly answer them as we can. But I think it's uh, high time to get into some demos. So let's go. Let's start customizing our UI. So if you're considering Xamarin Forms, or if you're using Xamarin Forms, and you're wondering, how can I more easily make changes to how it uh, looks or behaves on a specific platform, uh, then these are the options that I recommend kind of in this order of progression from easiest to most uh, specific or to full custom control, as I like to say. So uh, on the very far left here, what you see is the forms element. If you just throw the forms element onto a XAML page or onto your content page, this is what you're going to see. 
it's the basic appearance, no customizations. You're going to be able to get to some of the uh, styling and customization, certainly within forms. We expose a lot of that, but there may be some things that you can't quite get to. And so the first step that I'm going to look for is, is do I use a platform specific? And so what this is, is this is a, a little class that allows you to express something specific on that platform, as the name uh, suggests. Uh, and in our example, we're going to be looking at a picker control. Um, and so this is your combo box or your, on iOS, it looks like a um, slot machine. Um, and so if you want to change the behavior, for example, we're going to look at changing uh, whether or not picking something actually updates the text field that I'm looking at automatically or waits until I commit that change. So that's something that is easily done with a uh, platform specific, which we provide some out of the box, um, but you certainly are able to code your own, and there may even be some out there in the community. Uh, the next level is what is called a platform effect. So if you want to, for example, expose some bindable attached properties uh, to do some customization within your XAML or your C Sharp, um, and you want to have more control at the platform level of that control, uh, and, and make changes at that level, then a platform effect is the way to go. It's a bit more code, um, but uh, you, you again, you get, you're gaining more control along the way. Now, if that still doesn't suffice your needs and you're going to be making a lot of changes to behavior or styling, then a custom renderer is the way to go. And really, at this point, you're extending the platform renderer that we provide, and you're getting direct access to those native controls, and you can, you can go to town, uh, do whatever you need to do. So let's dive into some code. So I'll switch over to Visual Studio 2017. And one of the first things that I uh, would like to show you is one of my favorite new features of Visual Studio, the Xam Xamarin Forms Previewer. So we go to View Other Windows, and down here you'll see Xamarin Forms Previewer. Go ahead and launch this. And it came up really fast because I've already built my project. So make sure that you build your project. It'll tell you that uh, if you try to open this the first time. and then it might render a little slowly the first time, but once it's up and going, uh, you're in business. So what you can do, I'll take a stab at the top label there, and I'll just make an update to it, and you'll see that it renders real quick. And so I can be making changes, uh, validating that my layout looks the way that I expect it to long before I have to do a build and put it on my device. Um, so this is a very nice time saver uh, that I get a lot of use out of. So let me give you a little tour of our solution here. So I have a shared project for the uh, forms code. This is all of my XAML and my shared code. And then I have uh, an Android project, an iOS project, and a UWP head project. So um, those uh, are platform specific projects. And then the majority, if not all of my code is gonna go here in my shared project. Um, my demos all depend on a, a view model. So I've got a demo view model set up. Very simply, I notify property changed. Um, I've got a collection of strings, uh, a list of strings for my colors, which I get off of. Sorry, I'm flipping around on the page here. Uh, my uh, Xamarin Forms color, I go ahead and grab the fields off of there and throw those into a list so that I have something to display. Um, and then I've got a selected color property. And then, of course, uh, to make everything bindable and update, uh, I have an on property changed. Okay, so let's dive into the first demo. Uh, I have set up a picker standard page. So let's go on over to our picker standard. And it's just a content page and a picker. Uh, I'm binding my colors to the item source, and we're off and going. Um, so let's take a look at how that looks. Now, rather than uh, spend a bunch of time you watching me type and recompile, et cetera, et cetera, um, I've already got this app built and ready to go in the iOS simulator. So I'll go ahead and jump over to the simulator right here. Here's my demo app running. Uh, the code will all be on GitHub. It is on GitHub. And uh, you can have access to that, and, and I recommend you run these, um, especially as we get down to the layout performance stuff, get, uh, get the release builds going so that you can see how that stuff works. Okay, so here's our picker standard. As you can see, it's just the picker on the screen. Um, and if you remember from our uh, slide earlier about what the picker is made up of, this is the text field, uh, this is a toolbar, this is a button, toolbar item button, um, and this is the actual picker control down here. UI picker. 
Um, okay, so you can see that it's updating as we go. Now, uh, the first thing, the first customization that I want to do here is rather than it update the text field as I move the picker, I want it to wait until I hit done because, hey, I'm just flipping through here. I didn't actually want to make a change and inadvertently trigger something else to happen. So here's what we do. Let's go back to the code. And we're going to implement what's called a platform specific. So here's the XAML for my platform specific. And the only change that I've made here is that I've given the picker an X name so that I can reference it. Um, and I've chosen to implement my platform specific uh, in code. And this is what it looks like. So uh, once the view appears, I can now have a reference to my picker. And I'm going to tell it, hey, when I'm on iOS, and I'm using long form here, Xamarin Forms Platform Configuration iOS, when I'm on I iOS, set the update mode to when it's finished. Uh, the other option here is immediately. Immediately is the default as we've already seen. Now set update mode is a platform specific that ships with Xamarin Forms. Uh, you certainly can uh, do your own. And uh, I highly recommend that you look at the Xamarin Forms GitHub repository. Take a look at that real quick. Um, because that is where you're going to find all the platform specifics and the code that goes along with it, um, as well as when we get into custom renderers, you'll be able to find what those renderers are made up of and uh, read the source for it so that you know what you're doing. Okay. So let's take a look at this running in the simulator. Kick back over with our handy shortcut. So this is the platform specific. And now when I make my changes, you'll see that it is not changing. Go to blue, and then once I hit done, now it updates. Fantastic. Uh, so with that one line of code, I'm able to easily make a change to my application, and I'm getting closer to the, to the metal, if you will, of what iOS allows me to do. Now, the next enhancement that I want to make is uh, I want to change the color of the text that's in that box. So if you look at uh, when it first comes up, choose a color. Well, we're talking colors. I want to make sure that that's the color that I want it to be, not, not necessarily the default, which, hey, the default, it's the native. It's, it's the, what the, the, the platform provides. Um, that's not forms per se doing that. So the next uh, level up for customization is a platform effect. And rather than uh, learning or, or writing my own platform effect, which I certainly can and will do in a moment, uh, there's a great toolkit out there, the Forms Community Toolkit, that provides uh, several effects for us. So let's jump back over and go back to the browser. Okay, so here's the Forms Community Toolkit. And uh, up on GitHub, there are quite a few effects already provided for us here, and certainly you can contribute any that you have as well. Uh, the one that I'm going to be looking at is the Change Color Picker effect. So this is distributed as a NuGet package. So back in my solution to get started with this. Make sure that I've got my NuGet. Yep, there it is. It's installed. Uh, it's up to date in all of my projects. And you need to make sure that uh, when you add a NuGet like this, it is in all of your platform projects. And then I have a demo set up for this as well. So this is the picker effect. So a couple things we need to do. First, we need to have a reference to that uh, package that we just brought in. So we've got a new assembly. We add the, the namespace reference to it. Uh, thankfully, they have uh, good samples up on the GitHub for this. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use it on my picker. So namespace, pfx, change the color, and then color is a bindable property that they have exposed to us. And I'm going to go ahead and just make it red so that it stands out for us. Other than that, everything else is the same. So this is a, a, a bit of behavior and styling that I can just compose right on top of an existing control and inherit that or uh, you know get that behavior basically for free because somebody else wrote it for us. Okay, what does this look like? So now I've got a platform effect, boom. Just like that, the color's red. Very simple, didn't have to do a lot of code. 
but that allows me to go beyond what forms might expose to us. Because remember, forms is a common UI uh, API that's being exposed to you. So some of these things are very specific to iOS um, or to Android or to UWP as the case may be. Um, so anytime that I get to something that forms doesn't make super available to me, know that you can use a platform effect to start getting deeper into those platform APIs. All right, so what would this look like if I wanted to be able to, for example, uh, as soon as I picked Aqua, I want it to be Aqua. It's black. I want it to be Aqua. Well, I can uh, obviously the the uh, platform effect I've been using here from the Forms Community Toolkit does its job, but I want to do more. So now I can write my own. So let's take a look at what that entails in code. It's a little more involved, but essentially this is the same thing that the Forms Community Toolkit has done for us. Uh, we first need to define a routing effect. Um, so essentially what a routing effect is going to do is it's going to say, hey, when you ask for this effect, route it to this implementation. Simple enough, right? Um, so what's going on here is we've got a bindable property to the color. And this is attached. So now uh, this is how I can uh, use this in my XAML or in my code uh, to reference the color and bind to it. Uh, and then you see that we've got a public getter, public setter uh, down here set and get. Um, and you have to implement those, especially if you're using XAML C, uh, you're going to get some fun errors if you don't implement these guys. Um, and then down here at the bottom, before we get into the actual guts of this, you'll see that this is the routing effect exposed. So now that uh, it can actually get to everything it needs to get to, and you've got this reference here. Now, uh, there's a lot going on here, and we've got fantastic documentation about this. I'll jump over to Chrome here real quick and show you the documentation. Um, so intro to Xamarin Forms all the way down to some, some deeper stuff down here, platform features and, and things like this. Um, highly recommend that you go reference these things. I reference them regularly. Uh, I don't like to keep a lot of this stuff in my head. Platform specifics are here. Um, platform effects, routing effects, all down here. Um, so spend some good quality time there you will be better for it okay so that'll give you some further explanation as to what's going on here but this is essentially the magic that wires this up to the platform implementation so that uh, it knows what to do that's the routing okay so on color changed which is the uh, handler for the bindable property as you can see over here and what we're going to do is we're going to get a reference to the control. And of course, we want to make sure that we actually have the control that it's ready for us to do work with. And then we're going to get a reference to our color. Now, uh, we, don't, we want to make sure that we're not attaching the effect over and over and over again to this control. Uh, so first, we check to see that it exists. Um, if it does not exist, um, essentially, we're looking at the effects array on that control because you can add more than one effect. Um, so this effect is obviously working on the colors, but there may be other behavior that you want to uh, work on. And as long as that control supports those um, APIs, you can go ahead and do that. So in this case, it's specific to the picker. Uh, if I don't have it, I'm going to add it. If I do have it, I'm going to remove it. Simple as that. Now the other piece to this is the platform implementation of the effect. So let's go ahead and come down here into the iOS project and I've got an effect here. This is my implementation of the picker color effect. Uh, first of all, I want to call your attention to the assembly tags up here. Uh, this is the wiring that makes sure that the routing is happening as expected. Uh, you need to make sure that your names and your namespaces are all what, what it expects them to be. And this is probably where I spend most time referencing the documentation uh, to make sure that I get that correct. Okay, so I'm going to keep a, a local reference to my color so that I can check to make sure it's been updated or not. And there are two uh, generally uh, general methods that you're going to want to override. Um, on attached and on element property changed. Um, in my case, I don't need to do anything on attached because I'm, I'm going to be binding to this, so it's already going to be firing anyway. So everything I'm doing is going to come through on element property changed. Uh, so I've got a method here for update color. Uh, so similar to what I did before, I want to check for the color and compare it to my, uh, to my existing color. If it's the same, I don't want to bother updating anything on the control. 
But if it's new, I'm going to go ahead and take that new uh, value. And then this is where I can start getting into the, the bare metal of the platform. So a UI text field, that is part of UI kit, that is iOS all the way. Um, the attributed placeholder takes an NS attributed string. This is all obviously deep iOS stuff. Um, so you, you kind of need to know some of that here. But of course, if you are here, you're, you're wanting to make these kinds of deeper changes. Um, so this is going to change that very first color that you see on the placeholder text. But the color that I want to be able to get to is the actual color once you've made that change. And that's the text color. So control is a reference to my native control, which is wonderful. Uh, I need to make sure that I know that it's UI text field, which it is, of course. Um, and then I can assign my color to it. Easy as that. Now, if I need to do some cleanup, overriding on detached is where I would implement that here. Make sure I'm cleaning up, not holding on to anything, creating memory leaks, etc., etc. Be a good programmer. That's the PSA for that. All right, so let's go back to the, the XAML page and see how this is all implemented there. So similar to the uh, effect that we just looked at, we're going to do the same thing. We need to have a namespace reference. Uh, in this case, I don't need to reference the assembly because it's my existing assembly. Uh, it's my own. It's part of what I'm doing. I don't have a PCL. I have a shared project, so uh, it's the same. And I'm going to be referencing my routing effect, and I've given it the, the namespace of effects. And so similar to what you saw before, I'm also going to be doing pick a color effect dot color because why reinvent the wheel there? Um, and then I'm binding this this time. So this is my binding expression. I need to make sure that I'm converting my string back to a color because it expects color. That's the type that this property needs. Uh, and I'm doing it one way because I want to make sure that uh, I'm not um, you know, creating any unexpected behaviors here. Um, and then selected item. So every time an item is selected, it's going to update the selected color on my view model, which in turn is going to trigger this binding to fire here and uh, change my color. So let's jump over to the simulator now, and let's see this in action. So it's the picker platform effect binding. So red is what I have now. If I change it to aqua, I have aqua. This is exciting stuff. Chocolate. Who doesn't like chocolate? I like darker chocolate, to be honest. Crimson. Nobody consulted me on these colors. I think they're all standard Microsoft colors. Okay. So that is creating your own platform effect. Now to go even deeper into customizing these controls and really to get as close as you possibly can, we can go all the way down to a custom renderer, which essentially is going to extend uh, the renderer of our platform control. And you have access to absolutely everything. So let's take a look at what that might look like. So here's the requirement that I have, and I'll show you how I implemented this afterwards. So I'll go ahead and run the demo. So we have a color picker, as we have before. But now you see I've got a color for the background of the bar. I've also colored the button. So this is uh, some pretty low-level stuff that you need to be able to access. And a custom renderer is a, is a great way to do this sort of thing. And you may even be able to or want to get down here and start changing the, the background of the picker itself, the font, the color of the, of the picker items, and things like that. And you can get to all that stuff in a custom renderer. So here's how we wire up a custom renderer. Let's jump back to Visual Studio. And we'll look at our picker custom. So in this case, you see that it's not a picker anymore. Now it's a local custom picker. So I've defined my namespace here. It's in my webinar demos project. Um, the rest of the implementation is identical to what we've seen before, but now it's a, it's a custom control. So if we look at what that uh, is inside of my shared project here, I've got a renderers folder and a custom picker. And all I'm doing here is extending my picker. But what I need to do is I need to implement this at the platform level. So let's go down to iOS, and I have a renderer down here. And the way that this is wired up is, again, with this assembly tag, export renderer, when I ask for a custom picker, you provide a picker renderer. So that's really all there is to it. Once I've done that, I can start overriding properties. In my case, I'm going to override the on element changed. And the on element property change is available as well. I don't need that. All I want to be able to do is when I have a control, I want to get access to the toolbar. 
so that I can then change the color and then I can get access to my uh, bar item which is a UI bar button item and I can set the color of that text. This is all iOS code, right? So if you were doing Xamarin Native and Xamarin iOS, this is the kind of stuff that you would be writing there. Um, because, as I said, we build on top of Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android. Simple as that, we have a custom renderer. If I want to do even uh, more stuff here, use delegates, observe things, etc., that's very specific to iOS, this is where I would get to that. So you are as close to the metal as you can get. Full native, full performance. I know I've covered a lot here um, in this first set of demos. So if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat. Um, again, the documentation is a great place to reference ongoing for the deeper details to this. But hopefully this gives you a really good uh, idea of how you can progressively enhance your applications to go from the uh, wonderful stuff that Forms provides out of the box all the way through to full, complete control on the native platform. Okay, let's jump back to our slides. Next thing I want to talk about are deep links. So deep linking in your application is essentially the ability to have a URL, an action, that a user can click in an email or uh, on a web page, and that takes them directly into, or a notification, push notifications are a great place for this as well, and it takes that user directly into your app to the content that they're specifically looking for, aka deep linking. Um, so I used to work for a photo company and they did drip marketing as well as social sharing a lot. And it was great that we were able to implement this in our iOS and Android applications that uh, when we sent out those notifications, whether it was on Twitter or through email, with one click of a button, that user is taken directly into the photo sharing app to the photo that they were looking for. I'm sure you've experienced this in other applications, and this is a great bonus that you can add to your application to make it easier for your users to get to what they're looking for. So with Deep Links, it is iOS and Android only. UWP doesn't support this. Um, and with Android, you have a few extra setup steps. With iOS, this is uh, pretty, pretty well baked in. But with Android, you're gonna add a, an additional NuGet package that we've provided. Xamarin Forms app links, and you need to make sure that it's initialized in your main activity. Once that's all wired up, you're good to go, um, and I'll show you some of the implementation steps now within our application. Uh, essentially it is we're going to register the app link entry targets. So an app link entry is a, is a model representation of what that target is. And then we're going to override on app link request received, and that is how we're going to route those requests to the target. All right. Code demo time. As I mentioned, uh, in the main activity, we need to make sure that we have initialized. So I've already added the NuGet package uh, for the Android app links, and then I initialize it here before my application loads. So we're ready to go there. And then the other thing, as I mentioned, is we need to uh, create the entries and then route them. So in my application, uh, I've gone ahead and when my application starts up, I'm going to register some app links. We have a wonderful to-do application in our documentation, which I highly recommend, and I reference that in the resources, that shows how as you add to-dos that are dynamic, obviously data, um, you can create links for them and then you can remove those links. In my case, I'm taking the demos that I've created and I'm registering links for each one of those things. So make app link is a helper that I have. Um, it's simply, let's go down here to it. So here's make app link. It returns an app link entry, takes a title description and an ID. The ID needs to, you know, should be unique. So essentially I create my app link entry, um, add a couple of uh, key values to it for content type, what the app name is, and this is all going to get used within, um, within the, the OS so that it knows what it's routing to. And I'll show you that when I demo this here in just a second, I'll show you where that shows up. So once this is all registered, uh, we're good to go. 
now iOS, Android knows about these deep links, and when those things come in through a push notification, through a click in an email, through a web page, it knows now how to route that to the application. And then within the application, we need to route that to the deep part of our application. And so this is where we override the on app link request received. When that request comes in, we need to parse the URI because that's basically the, the payload that we get. We parse that. Uh, if we're not getting what we're looking for, if it's not part of our domain, our app domain, we want to kick that back out. Hey, this isn't something we need to worry about. Go somewhere else. Um, if it is part of our app, we can go ahead and process the rest of it. I'm going to split it apart, essentially, um, and look for my page parameter. So I'm just looking for the ID part. Um, when I get the ID, then I know, OK, uh, 0, that's my picker standard demo. I'm going to uh, push the navigation for that. Uh, same thing for the rest of these pages. So let's go see this in action. If I go back to my simulator, and I'll go back to the home screen, keyboard shortcut, and I'm going to search. So I'm going to search for uh, Picker. So as soon as I search for Picker, you see, oh, here we get, we get some uh, some deep link hits within my demo application. The picker, the picker with effect, um, the Zamagon, all this stuff is all set up when I created those entries. So I go to picker with effect, boom, there we go. We're right into the picker with effect. Didn't go to the home page, uh, do not pass go, etc. Uh, this is a great way to plus up your application and provide uh, some great user experience. The next thing I want to look at Come right back here to our slides. Uh, animation. Animation is another way to customize our applications and create a, a really great engaging experience. Um, so animation is not only fun, um, but it also can be very meaningful. So you can let people know that something is happening within your application. There's nothing more annoying than you, you're wondering, hey, did something happen? I clicked something. What's going on? Message received. Um, so animation is a great way to achieve that, and that's what I'm going to show here. There's a couple uh, ways to go about this. The most easy, uh, convenient way to do it is with the view extensions. So if you're going to fade, layout, rotate, as you see here, translate, scale, those are all right off of a view element. So you can just go view element dot fade, and, and you'll have access to that. They're essentially helpers that implement the animation class. So if you want to do something more complex, that's when we get into the animation class and you can build custom animations, uh, time things out, and we'll show that here in just a second with a nice demo. Um, and then easing. So essentially what easing is, and I think I have a slide here for that. Easing is saying, okay, over time, how should this behave? Should it start slow and end fast? Should it go really fast and then bounce back? All those sorts of things are achieved with easing equations. So over time, what's the velocity? What should it do? Um, this is a great little sample from easings.net that visualizes what each of those looks like. The uh, easing uh, labels that you'll see or the titles that you'll see in the animation library within Xamarin Forms differs slightly from what you see here, but the concepts for easing frameworks and tweening frameworks is very common throughout all, all the platforms I've ever worked with, and I've worked with quite a few. But let's jump into the demos again, because we love to see some code. All right, back to our pages, animation. Let's start with the animation extensions. So my page is simply this. Um, I've got a stack layout, I've got an image, an entry for a username, entry for a password, and a login button. So it's a typical login page, something I've, I've built several times before. And what I want to do is I want to add some animation so that when the user clicks the login button, they know something is happening. I've got a click handler for this, so let's look at my code behind. And very simply, I'm going to fade the Zamagon image, I'm going to fade the username and the password, and then I'm going to move the layout button. So let's take a look at that in the simulator. Back to our home, all the way back to our home. Alright, so view extensions, again, image, entry, entry, button, boom, all gone. It was so fast, it was so good, you want to see it again. All right. So, 
What if I don't want that to all happen at once? Because as you can see, those are all happening in parallel. What you can do, and this is what I'm showing up here in this code block, is you can await each one of those things. And when you await it, then it will wait until the image fades out before it asks the username to fade out, before it asks the password to fade out, etc. Um, and so that's a way that you can sequentially animate things. But when you want to do something more complex than that, let's jump back to the simulator and show it happening first so that we know what we're talking about. You can do a compound animation. So what I want to have happen, excuse me, I want the image to go away first and then the username and the password after that, kind of in a, a waterfall flow here. And then I want the, the button to do something special. There we go. So it's a little more complex, perhaps a bit contrived, may not be to everybody's tastes, but it exemplifies how I can choreograph my animations. The animation engine in, in Xamarin Forms is just fantastic. I hear that from customers too, not just me saying. All right, so back here to, uh, this is our compound animation. So you'll see that uh, essentially the same layout. I did choose to put this inside of an absolute so that I could do slightly different animation with it. Um, as with a stack layout, obviously it's very linear, top to bottom, left to right. Uh, with an absolute layout, I can start tweening things or, or moving things by their position um, more finely. Um, but essentially it's still just the image entry, entry, and a button. Now from an animation standpoint, um, this is what that looks like. So again, just the click handler. I create a new animation and I call it storyboard because to me you can call it timeline maybe, might make more sense. Um, but this is essentially is where I'm going to start adding, as you can see down here at the bottom, all my different animations. And I'll go ahead and get rid of this. I don't need that. Not used. Not used. I was playing around with some different ideas. Um, okay, so the first thing I want to express is how I want my, my Xamagon image to animate. So I have a new animation. Let's see. Oh, there we go. So I have a callback, and essentially that callback is what's going to fire every, every frame that this is called. So every time that D changes, uh, it's going to change the scale. It's going to start at a 1 and end at a 0. So I'm changing scale. Scale takes a 0 to a 1, 1 being full size, 0 being gone. Um, and then I'm using an easing of a spring out. Um, again, there are quite a few different easing equations, bouncing, cubic, linear, sine. Um, choose what you like. We could do that. Um, and that will determine when it calculates frame by frame from the start to the end, how much is it changing that value, and then every time it does, it updates the scale. All of these work essentially the same way. Uh, in the username, instead of changing the scale, I'm changing the X. As you can recall, when that animated, it just moved off screen right. Uh, same thing with the password. Identical animation. Um, the difference being the timing of it, right? So let's jump down here to the storyboard because the, uh, the button is essentially a, a, a similar scaling. So down here on the storyboard, I'm essentially saying, okay, add each of these animations to the larger scheme of things. And you're going to begin at, and it, it's from zero to one, you're going to begin at this and you're going to end or uh, finish at that. And then this is the animation that you're running. So essentially, uh, I'm sorry, I say essentially a lot, but uh, the Zamagon is going to start at zero and it's going to be done by 0 0.5 halfway through this timeline. Um, the username is going to start just slightly after that. The password will start slightly after that. And so this is also expressing the duration over how long of this entire animation do I want this to happen. And that is all relative to when I commit it. I commit it based on when the login, or based on the login button. And I give it a little tag here so that I can, let's see here, what is that called? It is called tag, isn't it? Oh, string, name. I give it a name so that I could reference it later if I needed to. Uh, but this length is the overall millisecond duration of that animation. So zero is zero seconds, or zero milliseconds, and one is two milliseconds. So over the course of that, this is the timeline of what's going to happen. Okay, so let's just go run that again now that you've kind of seen the code. And 
I know obviously you can, you're going to, everybody's going to download this and run this later, right? Just like that. So buttery smooth. It's beautiful. So animations, a uh, great way to enhance your application, not only for fun, but to make it meaningful and to give feedback to the user so they're not sitting there staring at a, uh, a stalled screen. Again, any questions about customizing your UI, anything that we've covered here, the chat's a great place to drop those questions. We'll get to answering them. Now, let's move on to talking about UI performance. I like to say that performance is a feature. I think that we hear that quite often, and I think it's pretty true. Um, so performance really begins with startup time. And uh, the Xamarin Forms team has been working hard to minimize startup time, to do everything we can, both with the underlying uh, framework, the Xamarin Android, Xamarin iOS, and UWP, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to not block anything and represent things quickly to the screen. Um, and then also within forms itself, making sure that we're not creating more resources than we need to. We're not taking undue time at inappropriate times to do things. But what can you be doing uh, to make sure that you're maximizing or minimizing, as the case may be, your startup time? So here's some things you should do. Simplify your initial UI. That very first screen that you want to have appear, make it as simple as you possibly can. Uh, a single image, make sure that that image is compressed appropriately, that it is uh, not larger than it needs to be. Um, if you're not aware on Android when you drop images into drawables folders, um, if you haven't sized it properly, Android may try doing some scaling for you, which may have unintended performance consequences. Um, so it's important to understand those things. You want to streamline the use of your application resources because all those things happen at startup. So if it doesn't need to be in application resources, it could be in the resource dictionary of a particular content page, put it there. Don't, don't overload your application resources unnecessarily. Um, I kind of already touched on this, optimize your images, make sure that they are compressed and ready to go for the platform that you're delivering them to. Yes, it might mean that you're creating many, many, many images, but uh, it, it really has a, a nice impact, a big impact on the performance of your applications. And then lazy load any data or assets. If you're doing a bunch of web calls, you know, 10 HTTP calls at the beginning of your application and the very first thing that gets initialized, that is going to impact your, your application. On the same note, here are some, some good do nots to remember. Don't block the UI thread. If you have to load some things uh, at the beginning of your application, try to use a background thread. Uh, don't block the UI thread because it blocks the user experience. Um, bloating with extra assemblies. So what I mean here is um, when you have a lot of dependencies for your application, whether through PCLs that you've created yourself that you need to have or through NuGet packages that uh, provide a lot of convenience to you, be aware that adding those dependencies, adding those extra assemblies to your application is going to slow down startup because it needs to wire all that stuff up to use them. Um, so if you can do without, you may want to do without. Now again, your mileage may vary. Um, it depends on every use case. I haven't found that I've needed in my applications to really do much of that, but um, if, you're, if you're up against the wall and you're trying to, to eke out every bit of performance you can, that's a, that's a good place to look. Inflating unnecessary UI. Um, if there's any UI that you don't need on the screen at that given time, wait. Don't put it up there. Um, rendering UI, inflating UI is quite expensive, uh, as well as destroying it. So you do that wisely. Be very uh, aware of what you're doing there. And then a word about custom fonts. Um, custom fonts typically, if you just wire them up as normal, are going to get uh, loaded up at, at startup. So if you don't need them right away, they're not part of your first screen or two, um, then load them when you need them, uh, kind of back to the whole lazy loading of assets uh, idea as well. Um, so those are some really good just uh, practices to have in mind. We are going to get to another demo here, so stay tuned. A couple words about layout performance. So understanding what is happening uh, during layout is really helpful so that uh, you can make sure when you create your layouts that you're not incurring extra cycles. So what do I mean by a layout cycle? Every time that we go to layout, that Xamarin Forms goes to layout a screen, it starts at the top of the visual tree and it loops down. 
and it asks every child, are you laid out? And that child asks its children, are you laid out? It's doing a me measuring and a layout cycle every time. And then once everything is laid out, that comes back up the tree, right? Um, and then we know what the layout is. Text uh, elements, text controls are notoriously some of the more complicated things to lay out and, re and may require additional cycles. So that's something to be aware of as well. Uh, something I like to remind people of is uh, when iOS scrolling was a big deal back in the early days and that first Twitter client came out and had buttery smooth animation, the way that they achieved that animation with all that text on screen was it wasn't text. It was an image that had been flattened. And that's why you couldn't select the text off that screen. And that's why it scrolled so quickly, because they didn't have the extra layout cycles for text. So these little known tricks that really aren't specific to Xamarin Forms or even iOS, they're pretty common across the board of, of, of all technologies, whether desktop or, or mobile. Um, OK, so uh, in terms of layout cycles, I'll just finish with constrained elements require fewer layout cycles. So what that means is, if you specify a fixed width or height, if you know it's always going to be this size, set that. Because then we can opt out of measuring those things, and it may not trigger remeasuring of other elements, which leads us to invalidation. So every time that the layout is invalidated through a binding, through anything changing in the, in the tree, it triggers a new layout cycle. And again, if you have an element with a constrained layout, it's only going to trigger when it's within something that changed, right? So if, it, uh, if, if nothing within it has changed and nothing above it has changed, it doesn't ripple throughout the rest of your layout and cause other things to change. So where you can constrain your layouts. Uh, measuring layout cycles is not super easy to do, but if you have a layout or you override your layout and you go into the invalidate layout, on child measure invalidated layout, or I'm sorry, on child measure invalidated, you can start counting how many layout cycles you're incurring there. Obviously, that's not something we really want to have to do on a regular ongoing basis, but if you're battling uh, eking out every bit of performance you can for the layout of your, of your application, uh, this, this is a, a great way to go about that. This is also where you would want to implement caching, as I mentioned here on the screen, um, and do custom layouts. Um, here's a link to a custom wrap layout and caching demo on our documentation site. I uh, highly recommend you look at that, both to understand how layout works within Xamarin Forms, as it does in a lot of uh, frameworks, um, but also to get an idea of how you can create your own custom layouts. Uh, because what you can do here is you can opt out of invalidation or layout cycles if you want to strictly control what triggers those things. Um, and by overriding these two methods, you have the ability to have complete control of those. All right. And one more word about performance before we dive into some demos. List view in particular. So we will all want our lists to be super performant. Uh, most apps have a list view, if not depend heavily upon them. Um, so what can we be doing? And this, this leans more towards Android uh, than it does iOS and UWP. Um, so when I mention fast scrolling, I'm, I'm speaking specifically about Android. So because we're building on top of Xamarin Android and because we're building on top of native, any performance tips that you read out there or that you find that are good guidance from Google or from Apple, uh, they apply here as well. So is fast scrolling enabled as a property on the list view uh, within Android? And we expose that to you now with a platform specific so that you can control that whether it's on or off. Make sure that you're using the right caching strategy for your, uh, for your application. So recycled views versus retained views. Um, making sure that you understand the difference between the two, and we have great documentation on that, um, and that you're using them appropriately. Uh, essentially, when you have a list and you have, what on our screen here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe plus the two on the top, so eight. Making sure that uh, if you can recycle views and reuse them, it keeps your memory footprint lower. And if you're on a constrained device, uh, which would be a, a, an Android device that may be lower uh, power, lower processor, lower memory, 
then recycling will really benefit those applications, those devices. Um, but if you have something where you need to make sure that you are not repainting all the time and you want to retain, then that might be the better strategy for you. And then one final note on list view performance. And again, these are not really specific to Xamarin Forms, but uh, they work here just as well because the same principles apply no matter what platform you're on. Constrain and flatten your cell views. So if you have a view, and I mentioned the Twitter example earlier, where you can render everything down and flatten it to a single item, do that. Um, the same goes for the hierarchy. Make sure that you're not nesting uh, stack layout within stack layout within stack layout, if you can get away with doing something else like, an, like a grid. Um, so that kind of leads us into the demos. Any questions about this stuff? I know I've said it several times, but it's worth repeating. Ask in the chat. We're happy to answer, point you to some good documentation. All right, let's look at the code. So layout, let's look at uh, an example of what we might consider a wasteful layout. Uh, and that's actually a term used in our documentation. I thought it was quite appropriate. So this isn't a horrible layout. Um, it really, you know, it's, it's a content page with a content. It's got a stack layout with a stack layout. Stack layout, stack layout, stack layout. So what we've got, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 ish, maybe 14, depending on uh, if the, the parent wraps it. Um, the thing with Android is forms currently pre fast renderers. And if you're not familiar with what fast renderers are, I'm going to explain that now. Pre fast renderers. Um, Xamarin Forms on Android essentially wraps every view element in a, in a group. Um, so for every one view element that you're creating, Forms is, is generating two that need to be inflated on Android. And Android inflation is notoriously um, slow and laborious. So what we've done with fast renderers is we've gone back to the drawing board and we said, okay, how can we optimize this? Clearly we should get rid of that extra view element. Now that means that we have a surface area that we need to accommodate now because that wrapping element was providing some features. So what we have now in the current version or the current pre-release of Xamarin Forms 235 is uh, three fast renderers, label, button, and image. And we've unwrapped each of those essentially. Uh, that's what you get. You get the bare bones, minimal number of view elements created on Android. And we're seeing some really, really nice gains depending on how they're used. If you throw a bunch of labels into a stack layout, I was seeing um, uh, upwards of a, let's see if I can say the math properly, you know, basically two times performance. Um, if you put it within a list view, I was seeing um, that although the initial launch of the screen was not faster, it was 1,200 items being bound to a list view, the scrolling was much smoother, especially, you know, be aware when you're testing these things, debug versus release. You get a much different experience in release than you do in debug. Okay, so essentially what we've got going on here is we've got, you know, 14 times 2, perhaps, uh, view elements being created. How can we maximize this? What can we do better? So let's look at our optimized layout. So the optimized layout looks like this. Instead of using uh, a hierarchy of nested stack layouts, so now we don't have a nesting issue anymore. Now we've got basically um, a, a slightly flatter, not terribly flatter, but slightly flatter layout. Um, we've got a grid. We've defined our grid columns and rows, and then we just have our elements. And grid, if you're not familiar, is a great uh, layout system. Tends to perform better. Um, that may not be every case, but uh, I would uh, lean towards this as a flatter way to go about your layouts than, than stacks. Of course, I have stacks in other places, and they are very useful. Um, so I define my grid, my row, my column, where I want these things to appear. So let's take a look at this uh, in the Android side of things this time. So I have a device hooked up, my Samsung S6 Edge Plus. And it's a great test device because my kids use it, which means it's full of all kinds of junk that I don't really want on there. So I get to see a little bit more real world performance. Uh, okay, so this is a uh, visor, which is just uh, showing you uh, my actual physical device. So this is the wasteful layout. I'll go ahead and tap that on my device. And it comes up pretty fast. But then I go to the optimized layout. Because it's a grid, it's 
going to be looking nicer to begin with. So this uh, may not show a big difference uh, for such a simple case. Um, the, the more complex your case, uh, the bigger difference you'll certainly see. And if you have an application full of wasteful layouts with lots of nesting and hierarchy, you'll really start to see that. All right, let's dive into the list view performance portion. So I have a basic list view page here. Uh, nothing fancy happening. It's just the list view, and I'm binding my color view models to it. And then I've expressed a view cell. And I'm using a very typical uh, way of doing a layout, which is nesting stack layout. So I've got one, two, three nested there. Uh, I'm using an image, and this is uh, something I would not recommend you doing, is having a, a bare image with a image. Uh, URL being loaded off the web. That's a lot of requests being made. There's no caching happening there whatsoever. So if you're really trying to get images into your cells and make them scream, uh, maybe prefetch them off the web, uh, or at least use some caching mechanism, something you roll your own, or use one of the third-party uh, images, image components that's out there that has uh, some caching built into it. Um, highly recommend that. So this is not ideal for good performance. So we're exemplifying that here. And then the nesting as well. Let's take a look at our optimized page. And I've taken a quick stab at optimizing this layout and taking advantage of a few other things that ListView has. So first, I want you to notice that I've uh, explicitly set a caching strategy here. I set this to recycle element, and we kind of covered recycle versus retain. Uh, so this way, I'm going to make sure that I'm not recreating or creating more rows than needed. So it's going to keep my memory footprint pretty low. Uh, again, test with your applications and your data sets and your cells to see which one performs better for you. I, I would recommend starting with Recycle Element. And then I've flattened out my layout here. So I have a relative layout in this case box view instead of an image view, so I'm not loading or hitting the web, not making any web requests. Um, and then using relative layout to position things left, right, and, and fill the center. Um, the other thing I want to note is that Android has some nice performance features built in that we can certainly take advantage of because, again, we're building on top of native. So anything that's performant for native certainly applies here as well. So I've given my list, uh, list view a name so that I can reference it in code. And then there's a platform specific that we ship now. And uh, you could certainly do this yourself uh, in previous versions. Um, but basically, it's set is fast scroll enabled. So fast scroll enabled is a feature of Android that uh, does magic within their system to make lists faster. So it's well named, aptly named. So I wanted to make sure that that's turned on. Uh, I do believe the default is yes, but wanted to exemplify that here that when there are performance things on the platform, uh, you can always get to them. Platform specifics is a great way to do that. So I've done that here. All right, I think that pretty much covers everything here in this layout. Again, flatter layout, uh, not calling to the web, using recycle element. Okay. So let me jump back over to Visor, and let's look at my Samsung. All right, so basic list view. So it came up pretty quickly. It's hit or miss sometimes. And as I scroll, this is a debug, but even through, I mean, it's probably exaggerated through the screencast, but as I'm scrolling, it's a bit jumpy. It kind of starts to catch it's not super smooth, and those images do come in a little late, although they look like they're accurate. Okay, so let's flip over to the optimized list view. I think that was faster, and that is very smooth. I can absolutely tell the difference between these two layouts, between these two list view implementations. This is much faster. Some of that speed you see is how quickly I'm touching my device. And when I run this in release mode, uh, it is, it's, it's better even yet. So highly recommend you download the demos uh, and, and with your own applications, implement some of these strategies and see what kind of difference you can make. 
Uh, with that, I think it's time to jump over into the resources and Q&A. We are. So some resources, make sure that you've, you're downloading the latest bits and, and pieces from visualstudio.com, xamarin.com. Um, all the uh, demos and code is up here on my GitHub. And then lots of documentation here. I think I've got a couple pages of documentation, as well as some good articles. Um, there's a nice animation article down here from uh, Jason Smith, and uh, then a nice blog here on maximizing your performance, um, which covers a lot of the same stuff that I just tried to highlight, um, but well worth looking at. There's so much more. I could I could have listed three, four pages of documentation links. We have such great documentation. Definitely go look at that stuff. And of course, reach out in the forums. Um, ask your questions now here in the chat, and let's talk.